Hello and welcome. We're Bob and Penny Lord, and we have a very special shrine to share with you today. Our Lord Jesus loves his mother Mary. He watches over her and protects everything on earth that had anything to do with her time here. It was the year 1291. The Saracens or Muslims had decided to vent their venom and hate against Christ and all things Christian. They were destroying every holy place in Palestine. The Crusades were over. The Crusaders had failed in their attempt to protect Christians and all Christian shrines. They were run out of the Holy Land. The Muslims wanted to eliminate every sign or vestige of Jesus' existence in history. They went on a rampage. There would not be a stone left upon a stone in the whole, any of the holy places. Satan was having a field day. He could see the last remnants of Christianity being destroyed in this holy land. The first stop was Bethlehem. They went to the church built over the spot where Christ was born. They would level it. But when they arrived in Bethlehem, they saw a building with a mosaic on the walls depicting the three wise men. This could not be the place of Jesus' birth. This must be a mosque dedicated to Arab kings of the past. So they left this holy place and continued looking for the birthplace of Jesus. Our Lord had used the angels to form a shield around the house, which blocked the minds and senses of the Arabs. He would not allow this place where his mother had given birth to him to be desecrated. At about the same time, hordes of Arabs rode for all they were worth, straining their horses to their limits towards Nazareth to destroy the house of Mary, where they knew the Christians had celebrated the Annunciation. From the time of Jesus' death, his apostles and disciples had celebrated mass at that place. It had become a shrine from the earliest days of the Christian movement. This was an important place for the Saracens to destroy. This is where it had all begun. Here Gabriel appeared to Mary. Here the Holy Family lived for 30 years until Jesus began his public ministry. But now, when danger seems so imminent, we can visualize an army of angels racing down from heaven. Their wings are glistening in the sun. St. Michael is in the lead as they speed to form a barricade around the house. The sky is filled with angels from one end of the horizon to the other. The Lord gave the angels a mandate. Move the holy house, take it to a safer place, far from the hatred of my enemies in this land of my birth. Lift it. Lift it high into the air where they can't get at it. Don't let them even see it. We can see Michael and Gabriel in charge, supervising the movement of the house where the Holy Spirit had formed the savior of the world in the womb of Mary. In unison, the angels lifted the house from its foundations and carried it high into the sky above the clouds where it could not be seen from earth. The angels carried the holy house high above the mountains and deserts of the Holy Land across the expansive Mediterranean and Adriatic seas to Yugoslavia. On May 10th, 1291, it landed in the quiet little hamlet of Tersanto in Yugoslavia, far from the battle cries of Palestine. Early one morning, the local people discovered, to their great surprise, a church resting on the ground. There was no foundation under it. Inside, there was a stone altar. On the altar was a cedar statue of Mary, standing with her divine son in her arms. The infant Jesus had the two first fingers of his right hand extended in a blessing, and with his left hand he held a golden sphere representing the world. Both Mary and Jesus were dressed in robes. Golden crowns were poised on both their heads. The people of the village were awestruck but confused. They didn't know what to make of it. The priest wasn't sure whether it was the work of our Lord or the devil until a short time later when Our Lady appeared to him. She said, 
Know that the house which has been brought up of late to your land is the same in which I was born and brought up. Here, at the Annunciation of the Archangel Gabriel, I conceived the Creator of all things. Here, the Word of the Eternal Father became man. The altar which was brought with this house was consecrated by Peter, Prince of the Apostles. This house has come from Nazareth to your shores by the power of God, of whom nothing is impossible. And now, in order that you may bear testimony to these things, be healed. Your unexpected and sudden recovery shall confirm the truth of what I have declared to you. The priest who had suffered for a long time with an illness was immediately cured. He promptly told all the people and word of this gift from God spread throughout the countryside. Pilgrimages began coming immediately to the shrine of the Holy House of Nazareth, which God had chosen to bring to this little village in Yugoslavia. A crude building was lovingly erected over the house to protect it from the elements. However, the joy that the Croatians had experienced at having this most precious gift in their midst was short-lived. Three years and five months later, on December the 10th, 1294, the Holy House disappeared from Croatia, never to return. Saddened by the loss, a devout man from Tersato built a small church, a replica of the Holy House, and placed it on a hill where the original had stood. He placed an inscription which is there till today. The Holy House of the Blessed Virgin came from Nazareth on the 10th of May in the year 1291 and left on the 10th of December, 1294. Shepherds in the area of Loreto, Italy, across the Adriatic Sea reported seeing a house in the air supported by angels flying across the sea. They reported one of the angels, Michael, wore a red cape and seemed to be leading the others. Our Lady and the baby Jesus was seated on top of the house. It continued inland and landed some four miles into a wooded area. The Holy House had moved again, only now from Yugoslavia to Italy, and it would move again three times in one year. The first location was in a wooded area. After the news of it had spread, many people came on pilgrimage to the house. But they were not all working on the same agenda. Robbers came and waylaid, robbed, and beat the pilgrims. The pilgrims stopped coming. The house quickly fell into neglect. The angels who had been put in charge of protecting the house lifted it again and set it down on a small hill in the middle of a farm. This land was owned by two brothers who began fighting immediately over the ownership of the house. So the angels moved the house a third time to another hill in the middle of a road, the site it occupies now and has for the last 700 years. Tradition tells us that as soon as the house moved off the brothers' property, they became the best of friends. The people of the area didn't know exactly what they had there. They knew it was a church and had appeared miraculously. They'd heard about its movement from place to place during its first year in the area. Then there were the reports of multitude of miracles taking place as a result of praying at the church. That was about as much as they knew. But in 1296, two years after it had landed in Loreto, Our Lady appeared to a very holy man, Paul of the Woods, a hermit. She explained the origin of the house and concluded with these words. It remained in the city of Nazareth to the great consolation of Christians until, by the permission of God, those who reverenced this holy house were expelled from the city by the arms of the infidels. And since no honor was any longer paid to it, and it was in evident danger of being profaned by the infidels in contempt of the Christian name, it seemed good to my beloved son to translate it from Nazareth to Yugoslavia by the hands of the angels and afterwards to remove it to your land. Paul of the Woods took the story to the people of Recanati, Italy. 
who, being aware of the miracles that had taken place at the house, sent a group of 16 men, first to Tersato and then to Nazareth, to check out the authenticity of the house. They took all the measurements and full details of the house with them. The people of Tersato verified that indeed the house had had walls of a reddish colored stone and were about 16 inches in thickness. When they had measured the copy that had been built in remembrance of the Holy House, they discovered that it measured the same as the Holy House in Loreto, 31 and a quarter feet long by 13 feet 4 inches wide by 28 feet high. They spoke of the one door, which too was 7 feet high with a 4 and a half foot wide opening. There was one window. They spoke of the earthenware vessels that the Italians, too, had found in the house. Their description of the Holy Mother and the infant Jesus could not have been more perfect. The investigators went on to Nazareth. There they would discover whether the house was that of the Annunciation or not. The measurements were exactly the same as those of the house in Loreto and the one that had been in Tersato. After a period of six months, the investigators returned and affirmed the authenticity of the house. In the years that followed, more inquiries were made. They found coins of that area and period. Stones and soil used for the grouting of the house were found to be identical with those in Nazareth from that level of civilization. For us as pilgrims, the house of Loreto is the scene of the Annunciation. It was here that the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and proclaimed she was chosen to bring the Son of God into the world. It was in this room that she would give that big yes that would change the course of the world. As we lean against these walls she brushed against, as she tended Jesus and his adopted father, St. Joseph, we dare to ponder what yes the Lord might be asking of us. Mary kept the plates and cups from which they ate inside the cupboard. Here in this holy house, we can almost touch her as she goes about her duties as a wife, a daughter, and a mother. We could spend days at this shrine, just meditating on the importance of this house in our lives as we dare to dream and walk through the 30 years Jesus spent here. The holy house became a popular place for pilgrims, a traffic problem developed. There was just one opening at the side of the house. When the pilgrims tried to exit, they would have to fight to get out because of the crowds trying to get in. Many were nearly crushed. Pope Clement VII decided to close the original door and have three doors built. He commissioned a famous architect to do the job. There may have been a problem, however, in that no one asked Our Lady for permission. When the architect took his hammer to make the first break in the stone, his hand withered and he began trembling helplessly. Regaining his strength, he fled from Loreto, never to return. After this, no one would go near the job. When the situation looked the dimmest, a cleric named Ventura Barino volunteered to do the job. He and his workmen fasted and prayed for three days before beginning. On the third day, Barino went up to the wall, fell to his knees, and prayed to Our Lady. His prayer went like this, Dear Lady, I'm innocent. It's not really me striking this wall, but the Pope. He's doing it so that your holy house will be more accessible to those people who would venerate you here. So if you are not happy with this task that we are about to undertake, I really would appreciate it if you would take it up with the Pope and not me. With that, the men began the remodeling of the holy house, which exists until today. Because of the large number of pilgrims, certain precautions needed to be taken. They'd have to brace the structure to be able to support the weight of the pilgrims. In addition, they'd have to preserve the holy building from the weather. So they covered it with a brick wall. But after the work was completed, the wall separated from the holy house. 
In the excavations beneath the house, there's enough room for a boy to walk between the house and the wall they'd built. You can also see that the house does not, till today, rest on a foundation. A bishop from Portugal visited the shrine at Loreto and thought it would be a terrific idea to take a stone out of the wall, bring it back to Portugal, and build a church in honor of Our Lady of Loreto. The priests at the shrine refused, however the Pope gave his permission. The bishop left his secretary in Loreto to remove the stone while he went to Trent. He removed the stone and began his trip to rejoin the bishop in Trent. The bishop suddenly became ill. As the secretary advanced closer, the bishop became more ill. By the time the secretary arrived, the bishop was near death. The bishop sent word to the local nuns to pray for his recovery. Two days later, he received word. Our Lady says, if the bishop wishes to recover, let him restore to the Virgin what he has taken away. The bishop and secretary were stunned. There was no way the nuns could have known except through Mary. The secretary left immediately for Loreto with the stone. As he got closer to Loreto, the bishop's health became better. When the stone was returned to the Holy House, the bishop was completely healed. He sent a letter to Loreto prescribing severe penalties on anyone removing any of the stones from the Holy House. Over the centuries, our popes have prohibited under threat of excommunication the removal of any part of the Holy House. Over the centuries, the Holy House of Nazareth has been a favorite shrine for saints, blesseds, and popes. Hundreds of saints have visited the Holy House, including Therese of Lisieux, Maximilian Kolbe, John Bosco, Francis de Sales, Teresa of Avila, Dominic Savio, Francis Cabrini, John Newman, Alphonse Liguori. Over 200 who have been canonized, beatified, or declared venerable by the church have come and prayed at the Holy House. Popes by the throngs came to Loreto and supported the Holy House, issuing papal bulls and special indulgences, sometimes aiding with the construction work of the Basilica. Pope John XXIII came to Loreto the day before he convened the Second Vatican Council and asked Our Lady of Loreto to protect and guide the Council. It was the Feast of St. Francis, October the 4th, 1962. Little did the smiling, jubilant people who cheered the beloved Pope know that within one short year, they would no longer have him with them on earth. The late Pope John Paul I came as a cardinal, as did Pope Paul VI. Pope John Paul II has come as Pope twice to the Holy House. Over the ages, pilgrims have prayed the rosary, circling the house on their knees, the ruts their shoes have made in the marble platform around the house, evidence of their devotion to Our Lady. We have felt such a strong presence of Mary here. I felt the closest to Mary I have ever felt in my life, inside the little holy house. We were given the name of our second book, The Many Faces of Mary, in Loreto. We believe we are placed by the Holy Spirit into an atmosphere, a vacuum, where Mary and the angels speak to us and we can actually hear them with our hearts. You don't have to go to the holy house of Loreto to hear Jesus, Mary, and the angels speak to you. It can happen anywhere, but give yourselves a treat. If the Lord wills it, go to this holy place where the Annunciation took place where the Holy Family lived for close to 30 years, where the angels have remained as protectors and guides for centuries. Open your mind and your heart to what your family, your heavenly family is saying to you. Loreto is called the poor man's Lourdes. During the summertime, the white train arrives twice a week bringing sick and infirmed pilgrims to the Holy House. Every evening after Mass, the sick process around the piazza of the Basilica to await the entrance of the Blessed Sacrament. They have come to Our Lady of Loreto, to the Holy House of Nazareth, 
to ask for her intercession with her son. In this holy place where a lady cared for her son, she now asks him to care for her other children. Although they have spent much time in the little house of Nazareth, have prayed the rosary to our Blessed Mother, they know, as she has told them, that her son Jesus is the only healer. And so, their hearts swell with hope and expectation as their Lord and Savior processes in front of them, blessing them as the priest raises the monstrance. As in Lourdes, no one leaves Loreto the same. Healings always take place. Healings of the body, of the mind, of the heart, and of the soul. You can feel the strong presence of our Lord Jesus here during these processions. You can feel the hope of the pilgrims as our Lord Jesus processes past them and as the priest blesses them. When you look into the eyes of these pilgrims, into the eyes of these people who have come great distances every year, just to be in the presence of Our Lady and Our Lord Jesus, you can feel the overpowering presence of God in our midst. Lord, as you hung dying on the cross for our sins, you gave us your blessed mother. Now we come before you and ask you to listen to that mother. The movement of the Holy House from the Holy Land to Yugoslavia and then to Italy has been documented from the very beginning in the late 13th century. We don't know why our Lord Jesus and his mother Mary moved the Holy House, but it's very possible that the onward move of the Muslims had something to do with it. The persecution of Christians was inhuman. The Turks waged war against the followers of Christ sweeping across Eastern Europe. The Holy House would have been a prime target, but the angels of God swooped it up from the hands of his enemies and brought it to Loreto, where it rests to this day. In around the year 1215 or 1218, St. Francis of Assisi said to his uh, friars, go to Loreto and build a monastery there. And they said, why would we open up a monastery in Loreto, there's nothing there. Little town. And he said, before the end of the century, this will be the holiest place on earth. Francis had just come back from visiting the Holy Land. We have to believe that our Lord Jesus and his mother Mary spoke to him there, and he knew what was going to happen here. You know, at the time when the Saracens were desecrating and leveling all the, the shrines of our Lord Jesus and his mother, the angels and our mother came and rescued this most important holy house. The holy house where a little girl was praying and the angel of the Lord appeared to her. She had been preparing her whole life for that moment. And when the angel of the Lord appeared to her, he asked her for that important yes that would lead us to our redemption. And we can just visualize heaven, a hush of heaven, and all these stars waiting for Mary to make her statement. And when Mary made the statement, I am the handmaiden of the Lord, let it be done unto me according to your will, it was done right here in this house. Many things happened in this house. This is actually where the Holy Family lived for 30 years. Because of that yes, that big yes, I think 
Of course, I always speak as a, a mother, a woman, a wife. I think of that enormous yes that she said. And when I think sometimes that, that the Lord asks us to say yes, and, and we're kind of scared, kind of shaking, what will it mean? What will it mean to our children? Mary did not hesitate. I think the big thing about this house for me is the trust Mary had in the Father. She trusted that he would use her yes, and that she would never have to bear more than she could. So it all started here. This has been the site of so many important miracles. There have been so many miracles attributed to Our Lady's intervention at this shrine that they stopped recording them. They just, they, there were just too many of them, they couldn't record them anymore. But this is so much more than a shrine, in addition to being the place where our Lord Jesus, Saint Joseph, and our Mother Mary lived for 30 years, this is also a place where people come for baptisms, First Holy Communions, they weddings, get married. people are buried from the, the Holy House, and every important date in their life usually has to do with the Holy House of Loreto. I've been listening to the pilgrims on this pilgrimage talking about their feelings here in the house. You know, you, they say, you can feel the Blessed Mother here. And this was the one place that I really didn't know what to expect. I felt like, uh, I, I, I just didn't know how I was gonna feel about it when I got here. And uh, I've been to Medjugorje, and I, I have never felt Mary's presence like I did today. I really felt it in that house. And I just, it just, I could just feel her presence there. There's no doubt about it. It was there. She was with us today. She was in that room with every one of us. And I, I just felt it. And I hope all of you did. Write us at the address on our screen or call us in the United States at 1-800-633-2484. We love you.